या देवी सर्वभूतेशु मातृरूपेण संस्थिता नमस्त 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 नमो नमः I bow to the Divine Mother. I bow to her presence in all of you. Today I would like to read from Conversations with Yogananda. The Master generally recommended a vegetarian uh, diet. Dr. Lewis said to us, when I first met the Master, he ga- I gave up eating all meat and fish. Some time later, however, I began to suffer mysterious aches and pains in my body. The doctors could find no reason for them. Finally, I asked the master what I might do. Your body had grown accustomed to eating meat, he said. Its cells have been been missing that diet. Once a week, therefore, eat a little lamb or chicken. No red meat, just lamb or chicken or a little fish. I followed his advice and in a very short time, all the pains went away. It was very interesting that Master was not a fanatic about anything. He said that in the first generation, he allowed people to eat meat. Then he tried to get them to eat less. And in our generation, when I came, we were supposed to be vegetarian, but he didn't make such a big issue of it. One time, it was actually when he and the group went up to San Francisco during the time that they were founding the UN, the United Nations. And on the way back, they stopped in a restaurant, and um, they, the, the people brought them a chicken a la king with, uh, I mean, with bits of meat in it. I think it was a Chinese dish. Anyway, um, there was a woman in the group who was very fanatical, not a disciple of his, In a way, yes. In a way, no. Um, I won't bother to explain that anymore. Sort of a student who respected him, but had her own path. Anyway, she was furious. She went storming into the kitchen, scolded the cooks, and he he said to the others, it's not that important. So all he did was just push the meat aside and eat the rest. What he said is, if you do eat meat, don't eat pork and don't eat beef or veal, don't eat red meats. Pork, he said, is, is an unclean animal. The uh, sweetness of a ham is due to the pus in it. That's not a very pleasant thought, but that's what he said. Beef, he said, he had actually gone into the houses where they slaughter these animals and seen them scoop the cancer out of these cows uh, when they'd been killed. And he said that it is not, it, it, uh, it makes you more susceptible to cancer, and it's in any way not a wholesome food. So he said, if you eat meat, as I just read, lamb, chicken, a little fish, well, Bengali is practicing a fish as a vegetarian diet. But the truth is that if you can, without making a big fuss of it, eat right. He didn't even like the word vegetarian. He said it smacks of isms. But he said, if we have to do it, I think a proper eaterianism, not vegetarianism with all the vegans and all the various ramifications of it. Just eat properly. The thing is, you aren't your diet. You're much more than that. Don't make that uh, an, an ism of yours, because people who do, they put so much energy into little things that they can't or don't have any left to spare to put them into the more important things. This, however, is very interesting, this story, where Dr. Lewis is getting these aches and pains, and he said it's because your body has grown accustomed to it. So you have also to think in terms of custom and habit and what your body cells have been used to. Fortunately, when I came to him, I was only 22, and I made quite a switch. I read the autobiography of a yogi, Immediately, I gave up fish, I mean, gave up meat. That same day, some friends of my parents invited me to lunch. They served chicken a la king. Well, I didn't want to insult them by refusing their lunch, but I put the chicken aside and ate it that way. But I made a complete turnaround. But uh, fortunately, I was young enough that it didn't 
affect me. Nonetheless, he said, don't, if you want to purify yourself, purify your heart. That's more important than having a pure body. I have seen many people who go make such a thing of eating pure foods that they don't meditate, they don't have time to love their neighbor, they're just being fanatics. One time, one of these people met, uh, visited our community at Ananda village, and uh, she was a fanatic, sort of, and so, sort of jokingly to impress her, I told her about the breakfast that I have. I used to make a fruit, sh a fruit shake with uh, nuts and different kinds of fruits and so on, and Sure enough, she said, that's why you're sick all the time, which I wasn't at all. You just, you can't get around these people. They've always got some ax to grind. Don't fall into that trap. It's much better to eat meat and love God than not to eat meat and forget about everything else. When you are on the spiritual path, remember the, the priorities, because you can't get to him by, there's so much talk in India about not being defiled by this and not being defiled by that. Uh, Richard Wright, the disciple that Master brought with him to, England, to India, he was in Bengal and they brought a big dinner out for them and they brought a big bowl of rice, big pot of rice, and uh, they offered it to Richard and Richard just touched the pot lightly to say no thank you. They had to take it out and throw it away and cook it all over again. I call that fanaticism. I call it just, why, why put so much energy into these little things that are supposed to uh, make you impure when you are mean to people, unkind, selfish, rude, angry, have all these faults that are far worse. It's much, this in religion, it's just a primary opportunity for people to become fanatics. That's why I didn't want to be religious until I had no choice, but I call myself spiritual, not religious. I just don't like sectarianism. It's so, it takes people away from the divine truth, which is to love God. There was somebody I mentioned in my book in, uh, called The Path, those of you who have read my autobiography, and uh, this man came to Master, very intellectual, and he had this long list of intellectual questions which he would finally get resolved in the presence of a saint. And he asked this first ponderous question. Master said, love God. The man shook his head. He couldn't quite figure out what this was all about. So he, he asked his second question. Master said, love God. And master, the fellow thought, well, he asked his third question. Master said, love God, and got up and walked out of the room. And so this man is always, he's done some public speaking and so on, he's always spoken of that to demonstrate that even masters have their problems. He never did understand that loving God is so much better than being able to define with hair-splitting accuracy. I've met so many people like that, and they think that their definitions are going to take them to some higher state of consciousness. God couldn't care less if you know how to define him correctly or not. He couldn't care less if you know how to split these hairs exactly and have all your philosophy exactly right and follow all the right teachings and not uh, be defiled by having contact with all these people. Honestly, there are a lot of things that have to be overcome and they're in all countries. My guru called the misery-making karma. It is misery-making karma. It causes misery to the poor people who are being suppressed. It causes misery of all kinds. We have to have a little common sense. First of all, we're living in this worldly world. That's a defilement, if you want to call it that. Being born in a physical body is a kind of defilement. Why well, think that way? If you love God and they're pure in your heart, you can find God even in spite of everything. There was one disciple of Master's, I've mentioned him before in these talks. He was he didn't really know how to follow very many rules. I told a story about when he went into a restaurant on the highway. It was late at night and no other restaurants were open and he found they had nothing but hamburgers, which of course is made of beef. So he thought, well, he won't know. So he ate a couple of them. And Master, when they spoke together after this man's arrival in uh, Encinitas, 
um, Master, after the conversation, said, oh, by the way, when you're on the highway late at night and you come to a restaurant that has nothing but meat, better not eat anything. But this man, um, he had such a pure heart. That was what counted. He wasn't even good at following rules, but he had a pure heart. And Master saw him one time on the beach, and he saw this great light around him, and he said that I he knew that Divine Mother had a saint there, and he used to tell us, he, even he will find liberation. Uh, he had said that several others would, even he. And he said, I don't know how, but Divine Mother says so, it must be so. So remember that Divine Mother doesn't look at these little things, after all, it's all a dream anyway. I don't say to use that as an excuse to just go have a hog wild and say, say in Texas, it's just a, be, do what you can sensibly, but um, love God, that's the important thing. One of his disciples was drafted and had to go into the army during the Second World War, and they certainly didn't uh, respect vegetarians. They gave them whatever they had, which was always meat of some kind. Master said, don't worry about it. Just keep your mind on God. It isn't going to defile you hopelessly. This thought that, that uh, things are going to make you pure or unpure is not the truth. They may help you. That's okay. But the truth is that your love for God is the thing that will wash away everything else. All Once you have a little experience of God's light, all other things vanish. I know... When I came to Master, I used to enjoy food. And I asked Master, please help me to overcome liking for good food. He said, don't bother about those little things. Just love God. When ecstasy comes, everything goes. Now that's the important thing. You can't do everything perfectly, but you can struggle toward ecstasy. You can't pay off all your karma. It would be impossible. But once you've achieved union with God, all those other things just vanish. When you have God, you have everything. When you don't have him, no matter how many things you do right, you still don't have it together. Master used to do, use the illustration of a castle and the lord of the castle. He said, get to know the lord of the castle don't worry about what all these flowers are and all these plants are and everything. Don't, you don't have to have any information except where is the Lord of this castle? How do I find him? Once, he, once you know him, he'll take you around and show you everything. In fact, in 1948, it was just a, a less than two months before I met Master. In fact, I think it was the, I was probably the first disciple who came to him after that. But he had a long samadhi of 48 hours, and it was an unusual kind of samadhi. Divine Mother later said that it was, he was the only one to whom, he had, to whom this experience had been given in this way. But he was in the samadhi talking, he would talk in the samadhi, then the Divine Mother would use his voice, and it would sound like a woman's voice. Then he would talk, and then she would talk through him. And in this ecstasy, she took him all over the universe just to show this point. But you, once you know the Lord of the castle, he'll take you around. He'll show you everything. He'll, you can understand everything in its right proportion, too, when you know him. And so um, he, he was sort of in his samadhi saying, now I see how you do it. And he and she together had a good chuckle over it. But it was a great experience, certainly. And she said to him at that time, Many, uh, I sent to you many lemons in the beginning to test your love for me. Now I'm sending you angels. But this was what uh, Divine Mother was pointing out clearly, perhaps also to help illustrate that simple point that he made. Once you know the Lord, he will take you around. Divine Mother will take you around and show you all these things. You don't have to understand how it works. I know that when I was a little boy, my father told me when I was growing up that it really upset him that I would keep asking him not, uh, when we were traveling, uh, do you have the keys, do you have your wallet? He didn't know, the, he didn't need to have me tell him. Here I was, six years old, 
It was just my fault. I thought I need to have it all together and to understand it. So I'm coming from that point of thinking that I needed to understand things, and I know now that it's the universe is perfectly capable of getting along without my help, and so is the world, and so is my life. And I've seen that when I just let him handle things, somehow things work a lot better. And so when people used to ask me in the early years of our community, Ananda, where did I want to take it? What did I see in the future? I said, just let's go day by day. I, I knew the direction we had to go, but if you think too carefully, it's got to go this way or that way, then you're lost. Well, I see by my watch, which I haven't been looking, that I've been talking too long. So please forgive me, and I will sing to you a song instead. Bye-bye. One day when I was roaming Alone across the lea I thought I heard a sad sweet voice Declare these words to me Declare these words to me Young man, where are you roaming Across this broken land The flowers are dead, the brittle trees are dying on every hand Are dying on every hand The grass it has been eaten The cattle hang their hands It's many a day in the ruthless sun since they were last leafing since they were last leafing the farmer he sits weeping a life of dreams is spent His true love shed it to the end Now their dog howls by their bed Now their dog howls by their bed Young man go to the farmer gaze deep into his eyes read there the dreams that filled his heart and killed his happiness and killed his happiness For life he thought these meadows Would give to be his own But life he gave not first to them And life he's never known And life he's never For peace he thought these meadows Would give to be his own But peace he gave not first to them And peace he's never known And peace he's never known 
for joy he thought these meadows would give to me his own but joy he gave not first to them and joy he's never known and joy he's never